Okay, we're rolling. All right, this is an interview at the Days Inn, Hicksville, New York, 3rd of August, 2004, approximately 1 p.m. Interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Uh, Raymond Linder. I'm 81 years old. I was born uh, June 16, 1923, in, in Woodhaven, Queens, New York okay. City. What was your educational background prior to entering service? Well, I I had started uh, in 1942. I started my third semester of engineering at the University of Illinois, and uh, I decided that uh, I'd like to kind of choose my service. So <clears throat> about mid-semester, I left Illinois, returned to Queens, and uh, intended to enlist. <clears throat> it was about uh, November of 42. So uh, <clears throat> my brother took a furlough to help me, to kind of guide me to enlist. Because <clears throat> I, I thought if I went in the Air Force, I could maybe learn some aircraft mechanics and things, you know. and along with my engineering. And uh, so <clears throat> what happened, the day we were going to go over to Manhattan to uh, enlist, that morning there was big headlines in the papers that you could no longer pick your service. And you had to go through the, uh, the draft. So here I, I had left uh, college had no job or anything, so the only way, only out for me was to go into the army through the draft. So that's what I did. I kind of volunteered. You could volunteer to be like number one. I went through uh, <clears throat> went through the draft board, and uh, on New Year's Eve, <clears throat> the draft board had sent me over to Grand Central Palace over in Manhattan, where I got my physical and was sworn into the service and uh, they gave us six days off so actually uh, January 7th I went through the draft board and into the army. Hey, I'm going to go back with a, a question a second. Do you remember where you were and um, your feelings, your reaction when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Yeah. <laughs> I was, um, I roomed in a, in a house that had about 10 to 12 fellows in it. It was a, a regular house. And uh, on that Sunday, <clears throat> we were sitting around in our room, and all of a sudden one of the fellows came running in and said, uh, turn the radio on, Pearl Harbor was bombed. So it was, uh, Kind of, uh, you know, I don't think anybody really knew how bad it was because uh, we knew we were at war, but nobody really realized what it meant to. Anybody know anybody. where Pearl Harbor Pardon was? Me? Did anyone know where Pearl we, Harbor was? <clears throat> we didn't really even know yeah. where Pearl Harbor yeah, was. Of... So uh, it was kind of new to us, mm -hmm. you know. Okay, um, okay, going back, you when you went into the Army, where did you go for your basic training? <clears throat> I went down uh, Camp Davis, North Carolina, <clears throat> and that was an artillery outfit. And uh, went through basic training there, and uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to remember now, we're going back a long time. <laughs> Take your book and read it. <laughs> yeah. uh, I went through basic. I managed to get a PFC rating down there. I was down there. I was still trying to get into the Air Force while I was in the Army. At the time, the the Air Force was part of the Army, as you yes. probably are aware of. It was the Army Air Corps. So uh, <clears throat> to try, I would really have to transfer. And what happened? I had to get a, a lot of data. To take the, before I could even take the test, the, the mental test to get into the Air Force, uh, I had to 
get some recommendations from home, a letters of recommendation, and I had to present that to them. Then I had to get our captain's permission to, to take the test, you know, to let me go. <clears throat> so I did all that, took the, uh, the mental test to get in. It was a bunch of questions, and you had to get a certain score. And uh, I passed, and the captain said it was okay to transfer. Actually, I think we were the first ones all week that had passed that test. There was another fellow from our outfit that went along with me. So that was about, that's, that was how I got in mm -hmm. to the Air Force. Okay. Now, you mentioned you were assigned to the 119th Coastal Artillery. Did you ever serve with them, or was that you were serving with them when you took the test? I was, I was in, that, in the Coastal Artillery for about five months, really. Okay. What was your job there? I was working in the, uh, I guess through my engineering I got picked, they put me in uh, regimental headquarters <clears throat> and I worked in, a, in the office where all the officers of the regiment were mm -hmm. and I, they assigned me to, uh, uh, to a group, I think it was planning and operations and they put me in there as a draftsman. So I was working as a draftsman. Okay, uh, so you went into the cadet program. Yes. Uh, where did you go for that? They uh, <clears throat> they sent us down to uh, Miami Beach, Florida, which was great. <laughs> you probably outranked most of the other men, didn't you? What, what happened? <laughs> I wound up in a group of fellows that had been transferred from the regular army. And uh, they told us at that time we really weren't supposed to go there because we had already had our ba basic training. Mm -hmm. So uh, they, they didn't want to send us back. They kind of accepted us there and put us in with all the other recruits. And uh, we stayed. It was great there. We stayed in... Uh, one of the hotels that was right on the beach <laughs> and it was on the main drag, Collins Avenue, uh -huh. up around 42nd Street and uh, we could run right out the back door into the ocean and it, w it was really nice and then uh, after spending five months in the regular army it was like a dream. So that was, we spent about uh, five or six weeks there mm -hmm. and uh, the Air Force had so many people in their cadet program that uh, they had to send us up to uh, kind of delay us so they sent us to uh, what they call a college training detachment up in West Virginia which was uh, at a regular College. It was West Virginia Wesleyan in Clarksburg, West Virginia, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and we took a number of courses there. That uh, some briefings in mathematics and some minor courses. I think it was just really a delay program. Mm -hmm. Just to keep you. Just busy. to keep us busy till we so yeah, could slot. get really put into the program. Mm -hmm. You know. And then where did you go from there? From there, after about uh, two months, they shipped us down to Nashville, Tennessee. And in Nashville, Tennessee, that's where the Air Force uh, put you through a, a bunch of tests to uh, determine whether you were going to be uh, in the pilot program, the navigator program or a bombardier program and uh, there was some mental tests and there was some coordination tests like I said we had a depth perception test and uh, various coordination tests and uh, <clears throat> you had to get a certain score and the uh, I scored 
I qualified for all three, so every fellow want to really be in a pilot training, you know. So uh, they gave me the pilot training. <clears throat> I scored a, a nine, eight, and a six. I think nine was bombardier, eight was uh, eight was for navigation, and six was pilot. And uh, then we had to go to, um, from there <clears throat> we went to uh, pre-flight school, which was in Montgomery, Alabama. And that was, uh, we were really like, a, a, that was where the real cadet training started. When we uh, shipped to Montgomery, the Air Force tried to make it a little like West Point. And when we got there, <clears throat> there was a bunch of cadet officers there waiting for us. And uh, they kind of gave us a routine of bracing and all that kind of discipline. And uh, at pre-flight, that was three months. And you took a lot of courses there for the weather and other things pertaining to flying and uh, a lot of physical training. Have you seen an airplane at that point? Or? I hadn't seen an airplane yet. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> after our time there, since I was in the since I was in the pilot training, <clears throat> the next phase was primary flying. And there was three phases of flying. Mm -hmm. It was supposed to be three months of primary, three months of basic flying, and three months, three months of uh, advanced flying. So primary flying was uh, done at a civilian flight school. So they shipped us to a uh, group I was with, went to Lakeland, Florida. And there was a, an aeronautical school there <clears throat> outside of Lakeland. And uh, we, we were there for uh, three months. We got about 60 hours flying time. What kind of airplane? It was a PT-17 Stim, and that's a double wing plane, mm -hmm. a two-seater. And the instructor sat in the front, and you sat in the back. <clears throat> And I managed to go through all that training at primary. And uh, as I said, there were 60 hours of flying, of flying time. And again, you took a lot of other kinds of courses there. And uh, we had acrobatic flying. And I soloed there, and I, I could do all those things. You'd learn how to do spins and you learn how to do rolls and and fly uh, the army way I guess and uh, at the time I finished up on that and then the next next uh, one was uh, basic school flying school from there that was in Cortland Alabama <coughs> That was where I met my nemesis as far as pilot school went. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I had an instructor there, he probably wasn't much older than me, and he really rained me out every time I flew, you know. And he, I think he, he made me nervous or something. But anyway, I didn't, uh, didn't make the grade there in basic. So what happened, we call that washing out. So. Uh, <coughs> I then had to uh, either go for navigator or bombardier school, which I qualified for. I tried to get navigator because that's what I really wanted after that. And uh, I wound up, they gave me bombardier, I guess, because they, I qualified the highest for bombardier. Mm -hmm. So then it was a matter of going to bombardier school and uh, 
I took bombardier training in Deming, New Mexico. That was a long way to go. But uh, that was about three months. I got through through the bombardier school and graduated in uh, November of 1944. Now, did you train primarily on the uh, Norden site? Yeah, I trained on a Norden bomb site. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know, we did take some navigation there too because uh, actually we, we wound up as bombardier navigators, you know. And uh, I used some navigation once later on. Uh, after that, I went to. Uh, Well, I did get a furlough and went home. Well, after that, we, we all got furloughs and went home, you know. But uh, when I came back from the furlough, I had gotten my commission as a sec second lieutenant when I graduated Bombardier School. Well, it took about a week, <clears throat> and uh, they finally uh, shipped me up to Westover Field, Massachusetts. That's outside of Springfield. Well, it was outside of Springfield. I don't know whether it's there anymore. And uh, the reason they sent us there, that's where they brought all the pilots, the co-pilots, and uh, the enlisted men that were going to make up crews for uh, B-24s. So we got there and they assembled all the men into crews and from there we were supposed to get our B-24 crew training. And we left there and took our crew training uh, at Chatham Field. That was in Savannah, Georgia. And uh, we went, we spent about two two months there and uh, we all, you had to take, we dropped bomb, you know, we, everybody had to do their own practice. The pilots did their, their thing on a V-24. We actually went through some stalls for them to know what the attitude of the plane was. We went on navigation trips. We went on gunnery trips. One gunnery <clears throat> trip we took out on uh, just out in the ocean. <clears throat> it was a bad trip. A B-24 has a twin tail, I think, if you recall. And when we were making a gunnery run, we were flying about 500 feet over the uh, over the water, and to practice the uh, firing the guns why we would uh, take drop uh, colored dye and then make a run and shoot our machine guns at them. What happened was, I don't know how it happened, but one of the ten man life rafts came off and it wrapped itself around a stabilizer, you know, the, the mm -hmm. twin tail <clears throat> and the CO2 cylinder which was pretty big for a 10-man rev, was banging on the uh, the elevator. And uh, the pilot, it was going like this, back and forth, and uh, the whole ship was shaking, you know, and it just hung on there. So, uh, I happened to be in the waist because I was practicing firing uh, 50 calibers. And uh, the pilot, finally saw what was happening, but he just couldn't control the plane because it was banging, you know, going up and down, shaking like crazy. So we headed right back to the, uh, the airport, and uh, luckily we got down okay. Uh, fire trucks were all there and everything, but it was kind of a scary experience. And there was a big, big what happened was it slipped off finally, but there was a big tremendous hole in the uh, in the elevator from where it was banging in there, you know. so that was uh, 
That was our experience there. Did they figure out what caused it, how it happened? No, the, the release mechanism was up in the, uh, the front by the pilot. Uh -huh. I, th I think one, uh, one of the engineers there, one of the enlisted men engineers, pulled that thing by mistake somehow, but he never owned up to it. Because uh -huh. I don't see how it could get out. It was a handle you had to pull to release that, yeah. that life raft. We finished that up and uh, I'm trying to think of, I was in 45, we finished up in 45 and uh, the war in Europe was kind of winding down. They sent us up to Westover Field again. I th We thought we were going to ship out over to Europe. <coughs> I think that they didn't need us anymore over there, you know. Mm -hmm. So we stayed up in West of a field about a, a month, and uh, they decided to send us over to the Pacific. So <clears throat> we started. Uh, they shipped us by train <clears throat> from West Over Field to Gowan Field in Boise, Idaho. We stayed there about a week, and then we went by train to uh, Matha Field, California, and that's where we, uh, that was kind of our outgoing, that was our debarkation, I think you call it debarkation, mm -hmm. and uh, Did you get on a boat to go? No, we, <coughs> we were, we flew our own B-24 over there, a replacement B-24 over to the Pacific. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> now what route did you take? We went from, we picked the plane up at uh, Matha Field, California. Mm -hmm. And our first stop was Honolulu. And we left, I think it was August 1st, 1946. Or 45. 45, I'm sorry, 1945. And in the briefing room, they told us it was going to be a 13 and a half hour flight That's for a B-24 to Honolulu. And in the ready room there, there was a bunch of crews. And there was a PBY crew there, which is a little flying boat. Mm -hmm. Their flying time to Honolulu was 23 hours, a long time. <clears throat> so anyway, we we got to uh, Honolulu after a long flight, and we stayed at Hickam Field one night. <clears throat> I only got into town for a couple of hours with Honolulu with uh, our navigator, and it was like Times Square. <laughs> with everybody having a uniform on, you know, it was from every uniform you could think of they had there. And uh, that was about it. We didn't really see much of Honolulu. Went back to Hickam Field, took off the next morning for the next little island, <coughs> which was uh, Canton Island. It was a little speck in the ocean. It's about a six hour flight. And we stayed there just overnight again and took off the next morning for uh, Tarawa, was the next stop. <clears throat> when we landed at Tarawa, you could see, uh, still see some boats in the water, you know, on the, mm -hmm. that were rusting in the water there from when uh, the Marines uh, took over. One is it got an interesting fact when I uh, got to, to the field. I asked a fellow, "Where's the cemetery?" I figured I thought there was a cemetery for Marines there, and uh, I was going to take a look at it if there was one there. So he told me he directed me to the cemetery, and when I got there, it was a civilian cemetery, <coughs> and. Uh, 
I, I didn't have time to look, look any further, but 50 years later, I met a Marine <clears throat> here in Huntington that uh, fought in Tarawa. So I told him, I said, I looked for a cemetery there. I said, I couldn't find a cemetery. He says, when we, when the battle was over, he said, everybody, all the Japanese were buried when they built the strip of the airfield there, when it was, he says, they were bulldozed over. Mm -hmm. and, I, and he said, the, the Americans and the Japanese, I said, I don't think any Americans would be taken that way. And I said, I, I read recently that the Americans were removed to another island. Mm -hmm. I said, I don't believe that. And he, his retort to me was, and you really believe it too. So I couldn't say anything. I still don't believe that they would take Americans like that. Mm -hmm. But I think the Japanese were. Well, I have one on other stuff. Tarama Tarawa. Yep. Uh, next stop after that was the next day was Los Negros Islands. That was, that's over towards Indonesia, I mm -hmm. think it was. That was just a little small island. And then uh, the next stop after that was uh, Biak, New Guinea, <coughs> which was our destination. And in Biak, New Guinea, <clears throat> that was where you would get assigned to various bomb groups or wherever in the Pacific. So we got a, that was five days it took to get over to Biak. On August 6th, I left on August 1st, on August 6th, they dropped the atom bomb. <clears throat> now I... I was kind of lucky. When they dropped the atom bomb, I don't think they didn't surrender right away, but the, uh, the Japanese, uh, I think the one on Nagasaki was the second one around the 14th, I'm not sure anymore. Mm -hmm. But when they surrendered, there were some celebrations over there. Everybody was shooting their guns in the air, you know. and. Uh, we were one happy bunch that it was over. So that was, I have always figured that that might have saved my life, you know, that atom bomb. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, how much I, longer did you stay over there? I mean, you just got well, there. I, got a, I actually got assigned to the 22nd Bomb Group on Okinawa. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we had a flyer, B-24, from New Guinea all the way up to Okinawa. So uh, we left there somewhere around the middle of August, right after they dropped, they surrendered. And we went up to, uh, our first stop was uh, Manila in the Philippines. And we got held up there because it was bad flying weather to get up to Okinawa. So we were held up there a few days and uh, we landed on Okinawa <coughs> on, uh, I was assigned to the 22nd Bomb Group, the 19th Squadron. And uh, when I, we were, we were all living in tents there, big, big tents. Each tent held about 16 men. Mm -hmm. So when I walked in the tent with my uh, bag and everything, the fellows were all around the radio listening to the surrender ceremonies on uh, September 2nd in Tokyo. <clears throat> so, more or less, I was stuck in that bomb group, you know, mm -hmm. till uh, they could turn everybody around and go home. Now, once the war had ended, did you continue flying any kind of missions, training missions or observation missions or anything? <coughs> Well, that was a B-24 outfit, but what happened, they started demobilizing rapidly. Mm -hmm. And uh, within a couple of weeks, let's see, I'm trying to think of 
within about three weeks, some men went home from our outfit, and they they took the B twenty. They took about seven or eight B twenty fours and flew them back down to Manila, and they loaded those fellows up who had enough points to go home because they had a point system, and uh, I didn't I didn't have enough points to go home. So uh, most of our B twenty fours were gone, and then they started to make our outfit into a B-25 outfit and uh, I was I got some flying time in on B-25s in fact a short time after we were flying B-25s there they, <coughs> they changed the uh, again changed the plane we were going to fly uh, that our group was going to fly into uh, an A-26 outfit. An A-26 was the newest plane, twin-engine plane. The B-25 was a twin-engine plane. And uh, we had to pick them up down in Manila at Clark Field. <coughs> and I had another bad experience on that one. What happened, uh, they loaded up. We had to overload the uh, the big 25s we're going to fly them down to Manila, leave them in there, and pick up these new A26s. And uh, <clears throat> they didn't. They were going to bring back more, more uh, A26s than we had B25s. So what happened? We had to overload personnel on the B25s. And uh, and <clears throat> so I don't know how many we had now, but uh, I guess we had about seven or eight B-25s. So on the B-25 I was on, incidentally, I was I was picked to be a navigator to navigate back, which was a shock to me because I wasn't much of a navigator, you know. And especially over the ocean, you had to do what's called dead reckoning. Mm -hmm. And it was about a six or seven hour flight down to Manila over a lot of open water. So anyway, on the B-25 that I was on, I was in a waste with about six enlisted men, radio operators and so forth. And in the pilot compartment there was about four, four guys. The man flying was a captain and uh, I think there were pilots in there. So <clears throat> I was the only officer in the waist with the six enlisted men. And we took off, <clears throat> got about halfway down to uh, Manila when uh, one of the engines started sputtering. <clears throat> and it kept sputtering, which, uh, and we were over open water. We'd, we were out a couple hours, so it was kind of bad. What happened, we, we kept losing altitude, kept sputtering, so the, uh, the captain told us over the intercom to, uh, in the waist, to get ready to bail out, <coughs> yeah, which nice. was uh, not a good thing. I said a lot of prayers that day. So the <coughs> B-25 has a hatch in the, in the waist floor that you can bail out to get to bail out. It's about a three by five foot hatch, you just pick it up. So <clears throat> he says get ready to bail out. So we had to pick up that hatch and the six enlisted men were all talking. It was crowded. It was like being in a, a building elevator, you know. That's to have seven seven guys in the waist of a B-25, that's very small. It was like being in an ele elevator. He said uh, one, one guy turned around and said uh, to me, Lieutenant, this is with the hatch open. Lieutenant, since you're a, an officer, we think you should be the guy that goes first. <laughs> Which kind of shocked me. <clears throat> so, actually, I was actually at the, the open hatch, first one in line to bail out, which I don't think was a good, now I don't think was the right thing to do, because we here we are over the ocean and you're going to bail out into what, you know. So we were there ready to bail out, and uh, we kept going lower and lower. 
So we got down about 5,000 feet, I'd say, and all of a sudden the engine caught, and what the, uh, the pilot, he, he said that, that he thought it was carburetor icing, you know, in the, due to the higher altitude, and that uh, we had ice in the carburetor. So luckily from there we went down to Clark Field and we were okay. <laughs> You're still here. I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a good thing you didn't bail out. Yeah, yeah. I right. didn't, boy. I had to get that now. You wouldn't be here if you did. And uh, that's about it. We flew the A26 back. I had to navigate and didn't know what I was doing on the navigation. But we got back to Okinawa. And from Okinawa, after about two months, I tried to see my brother. I had a, my oldest brother was uh, went through the battles of Okinawa. I had hoped to see him, but I met when I, we landed on Okinawa from uh, from uh, when I got assigned to Okinawa that first day. I missed him by one day seeing him. So he went up to Seoul, Korea, with the occupation, and uh, eventually I went up to Japan around Osaka. Mm -hmm. And by the time we got up to Japan, we, were not, we weren't even an A-26 outfit anymore. We were a, a, a fighter pilot outfit. Now, I don't, I don't know what a Bombardier was going to do in a fighter pilot outfit, but uh, the Air Force was really demobilizing in one big hurry. So that's what happened. I wound up there in, uh, around Osaka at a Tommy Air Base, I think it was. And uh, was up there for about four months, I guess. And uh, finally uh, got to go home from Tokyo by boat. Now, what did you do in that four months? Obviously, you didn't do any uh, flying. Didn't do much flying there, no, because yeah, I wasn't in the mood for flying anyway. <laughs> to tell you the truth, after that last experience, so I didn't care, uh -huh. you know. Do you have much uh, contact with the Japanese people? Not too much. <clears throat> they, uh, I did ride a subway there, and uh, we went. We went to this uh, religious city. I can't think of the name of it now anymore. It's near Osaka, but that's that's beside the point. We were, They seem to accept us. Pretty much so. We didn't have any trouble with the Japanese. You could go really anywhere, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had no troubles with them. It's not like it is over here in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. They, uh, there was no problems at all. Now, um, I noticed in your forum you said that you had a very young crew. Oh, yeah. I was... Uh, I was 21, I guess, when I when I got on the crew. We had one fellow that was only 19 years old. He was he was the nose gunner. The, the pilot was the oldest one. He was 25. The co-pilot was 24. It was one enlisted man was 23, and the others were under 23. With the youngest being 19, he was a nose gunner, we had a tail gunner, a uh, ball turret gunner, and two waist gunners. Of course, How did I, you like the B-24? <clears throat> it was a good ship, good plane. It was faster than a B-17, a little faster. It had a bigger range than a B-17, a longer range, and uh, that's why it was used mostly in the Pacific. It's a good, good plane. When were you discharged? I was discharged. I got home in uh, in May. <clears throat> took a train across the states. We took the boat landed in Seattle. Took a train across the states to uh, Jersey. Fort. Fort Dix? Fort Dix? Around Princeton. Might have been 
Might have been Fort Dix. I, think it, I think it probably was Fort Dix. And uh, from there I took a train into uh, Penn Station and that was it. Did you ever make use of the GI Bill? I went back to Illinois on a GI Bill <coughs> and uh, graduated as an electrical engineer in 1950. I was about five years too late by the time it was with the lost time, you know. I should have graduated in 1945. So, well, I was one of the lucky ones. I lost one of my brothers was killed in action in France, and uh, that was tough to take. So you had a brother that was in the service in Europe. You had a brother that I had was a brother. In the army, in the, the army, he, he fought in Leyte mm -hmm. and Okinawa. Was he with the 27th Division? Do you know? Which my brother? Yeah. Yeah. When I was in the Pacific. Oh, he was with the 24th Corps. Oh, okay. He was in Corps headquarters in the 24th Corps, and uh, he was with them on Leyte. And the landings on Leyte, the and then the landings on Okinawa, and two to battle. The other one was killed in Europe. And the, uh, the other one was in the 103rd Infantry Division in France. Did you ever make use of the 5220 Club? I did. <laughs> Can we exit out? <laughs> what is that? No, I don't think it. No, because uh, was a you don't know what the 5220 Club was. 5220 no. Club was. You could get twenty dollars a week for fifty-two weeks. It was unemployment basically. Oh. Or unemployment <laughs> if you were out in the army. You know, when you got out of the army. No, because uh, I was on furlough when I got out till June, and I didn't get back in college till uh, the following January of '47. So. Uh, I had a tough time getting back in school. I was going to go back in school in New York City, but uh, they wouldn't accept me as a transfer student at NYU. They said, you better go back to Illinois. There were so many GIs going into schools, you know, to college. They were all really crowded. So that's why I went back to one. Uh, Did you uh, join any veterans organizations? Have you been active I, at all? Or? I didn't join any organizations, no. Did you ever stay in contact with anyone that was in service with you? No. <clears throat> I even looked on the computer to see if I could find them, you know, any of the crew. I couldn't find any of them. I haven't found any. Even looked on the Social Security test index, you know. Yeah. I never found any of them. <clears throat> uh, I wish I had kept in contact with them. I tried to find our navigator shortly after I got home, you know, but uh, he was from Chicago. I got his mother, but never got him after that. So unfortunately, I never got to see any of them. How do you think your time in service had an effect or changed your life in any way? Well, that's Hard to say. I, I thought being in service was a good thing, you know. Of course, I, I didn't get involved in in any of the missions or any of the action, and so <clears throat> I really enjoyed it, you know. And uh, sometimes uh, later on, I would think I I wish I had stayed in the service, you know. But uh, I really wanted to finish college and be an engineer, and. Uh, I think it was good training for a, a young fellow to service. You know, it gives you a lot of discipline and so forth to face life. And so I never regretted being in the Army and the, mm -hmm. the Air Force. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much for your interview. Okay. Too bad.